reading philosophy is a skill and so like every other skill you start off very badly at it and you get better at it over time as you practice and that takes a long time and a lot of hard work and you have to put in the practice to get better and nobody can do that except for you i can't give you the skills you have to develop them on your own but what i can do is sort of model what you want to be doing uh, the way in which you want to be reading philosophy and then when you have a sort of model in mind and a set of uh, things to aim for that can help you practice in a deliberate way when you read and then you'll get better as you practice so that's what we're going to do in this video i'm basically going to model a good way for students to read philosophy and then we'll go through and talk about why i'm doing the things i'm doing and how i'm doing the things i'm doing and then you'll have something to aim for and something to practice as you read philosophy on your own and then there's two things to note before we begin the video so first this is how I read philosophy. This is broadly how philosophers tend to read philosophy. But of course, there are various differences and various ways of conceiving of how to do this. And so if you want a sort of another perspective on this, maybe something in more detail, something written out, a lot of this is very similar to the process described in this paper by David Concepcion, reading philosophy with background knowledge and metacognition. And if you download this paper, it's free online and you go uh, sort of halfway through, you'll find an appendix, How to Read Philosophy, and that's for students uh, like you, and you can go through this appendix, and this is uh, Concepcion's sort of uh, description of his process for reading, which again is very similar to the one I'm going to model. So that's the first point. Uh, make sure to check that out if you want another source. And the second point is that this video is a version of something I do in a lot of my introductory classes. It's um, a workshop I've run a few times, and so it's designed to be interactive, something uh, that I'm doing with the students who are there. And of course, this video is not interactive, but if you can watch this video with other people uh, and sort of make it interactive, that would be great. So uh, maybe pause the video right now, find some other people who are interested in learning how to read philosophy, and then at various times through the video, I'll have you pause and discuss with them if you can. So that would be great. Uh, but let's begin. So I've just selected a sort of sample philosophy article. The techniques that I'm going to demonstrate will work for any work of philosophy that you want to read, uh, but we're going to use uh, this article, Human Reproductive Cloning, A Conflict of Liberties. And so let's sort of see how I read through it and what sorts of things I do when I read philosophy. So first I read the title and the author. Normally you'd want to read the abstract first to sort of get an idea of what the whole article is going to be about, to get a sort of summary of things. If there's an abstract, Sometimes there's not an abstract. If you're reading a book, there won't be an abstract. So we're just going to skip the abstract here, especially because we're not going to read through the entire article, so we won't get there. Uh, so we'll just start reading the article itself. In principle, it is often argued, human reproductive cloning ought to be permitted based on one of the most fundamental elements of personal liberty, the right to reproductive freedom. So I read that sentence and I think to myself a lot of things. So we start off with in principle and I ask myself, what does in principle mean? Well, if you think about what in principle means, we often use it to contrast with sort of in practice. So we have things that are in principle or maybe in theory. And then on the other hand, we have things that are in practice or in reality. So in principle is sort of talking about like theoretical issues or uh, non-practical issues or issues of principle, sort of ideals that we have. Uh, rather than sort of actual concrete things. So I know in principle, whatever follows from here, it's not going to be something sort of concrete and um, about the real world, maybe about how we do things. It's about maybe how things ought to work or how things should be or um, a sort of ideal model of things, a theoretical model of things. So I have that in mind. So, okay, so in principle, it is often argued. And so when somebody says, look, it's often argued that X, Y, Z, often that sort of implies that they don't agree with it. So often when you say something like, oh, people often argue this sort of thing, it's because you want to describe what other people are saying and then you say your own thing. So I'm thinking in my head, does the author agree with what's going to follow? Maybe, maybe not. I'm sort of leaning in the direction of no. I'm sort of, if I had to guess, I'd say this is something the author is not going to agree with, but I don't know yet. I'm just sort of uh, mapping out the possibilities in my head. So I do know it's often argued, so I know this is a sort of common argument. It's not some like rare argument that just one philosopher made one time. This is something people often say. Um, what does it mean to say something's argued? Oh, it's that somebody sort of uh, gives a sort of uh, claim or 
uh, is trying to advance a sort of position. They're giving reasons for their claim. So this is something people often do. I don't know who is often arguing this thing. I don't know if the author is one of the people who's joining in the argument or not, but I do have in mind, okay, there's this argument. I don't know what the argument is yet, but there's an argument and it's a sort of common one. And it's an in principle argument. So it's an argument not about practicalities, but about principles. Okay, so I'm ready to go on. Human reproductive cloning. So human reproductive cloning. I ask myself, what is that? Well, I know, I know what humans are. I know what cloning is. I guess reproduction is sort of making more humans. Uh, so I guess human reproductive cloning is human cloning for the sake of reproduction. And I might ask myself, well, are there other kinds of human cloning? So why is the word reproductive there? And um, I think, well, look, maybe there could be reasons to clone humans apart from reproduction. Maybe it could be something uh, like we're growing human organs or something. So I don't want more humans. I just want a bunch of organs to harvest for the existing humans. Or maybe human scientific cloning, cloning humans for scientific purposes. Not because we want more humans, but just because we want to study human reproduction or something. So human reproductive cloning, that's the sort of topic here, ought to be permitted. So I ask myself, what does it mean that something ought to be permitted? Well, uh, it means we shouldn't forbid it. So maybe we shouldn't make laws against it. We shouldn't make it illegal for people to do human reproductive cloning. Uh, we shouldn't throw people in jail or give people fines for human reproductive cloning. Maybe we shouldn't get angry at people who engage in human reproductive cloning. We should let them do their human reproductive cloning. So we have in principle, it's often argued this sort of thing ought to be permitted. So people often argue we should allow human reproductive cloning, at least in principle. And so why? Like, why might they argue this? Oh, based on one of the most fundamental elements of personal liberty. So this is why we should permit human reproductive cloning. Okay. One of the most fundamental elements of personal liberty. So I ask myself, What's going on there? Well, it seems pretty straightforward. I don't know what the element is. I'm waiting to hear what this fundamental element is, but it's some sort of important aspect of personal liberty. And I sort of know what personal liberty is. It's like me getting to do whatever I want to do, people getting to do whatever they want to do, sort of being free, things like this. Uh, comma, the right to reproductive freedom. Oh, so here's the fundamental element of personal liberty. It's the right to reproductive freedom. And I ask myself, oh, what is that? Do I know what the right to reproductive freedom is? Well, I know what a right is. It's something you're sort of able to do. It's a space where nobody can stop you from doing something. And my right to reproductive freedom, well, what does that involve? I'm thinking things like uh, maybe abortion, using contraceptives, using in vitro fertilization. Maybe these sorts of things involve the reproduction. Maybe my being allowed to do these things, that would be sort of the right to reproductive freedom. And so. This argument, it seems like, is saying human reproductive cloning is like that. This is one of those things that fits into the right to reproductive freedom. So I have in my mind, okay, that's sort of the picture. There's this in principle argument about reproductive freedom, and uh, it's something that people often say. So, okay, that's sentence one. Good to go. I think I've got everything uh, internalized there. Sentence number two. The argument tends to go something like this. Individuals have a right to reproduce as they choose, as long as in doing so, they do not violate other rights or moral injunctions. So starting in again on sentence two, the argument tends to go something like this. So again, this is something people often argue. So there's like lots of versions of it. And so here's how it usually tends to go. This is sort of maybe like the most common version of it. And it goes something like this. So we're, we're about to get the, an outline of this earlier argument, this in principle argument that we've seen. So how does it work? Individuals, so I guess this is individual humans, have a right to reproduce as they choose. So again, I'm thinking back, that's sort of what I had in mind with this right to reproductive freedom thing. So my right to reproduce however I choose, you know, I can use contraceptives or and not reproduce, or I can use in vitro fertilization, something like that. Okay, a right to reproduce as they choose. As long as in doing so, they do not violate other rights or moral injunctions. Okay, so that's all straightforward up until the word injunctions. That's a slightly uncommon word. If I don't know what injunctions means, I'm going to go and look it up in a dictionary so I can get clear on uh, sort of what it means. For like 10 years, I had the opposite view. I thought injunctions meant the opposite of what it did. So really, I had to have looked that word up uh, much sooner. And so uh, anytime I encounter a word that I'm not sure about or that I don't know, definitely look it up. Don't just sit there with a question mark. So I look up injunctions, and then I think I know exactly uh, 
what this means. So okay, that's pretty straightforward. A right to reproduce as I choose, as long as I don't do anything else wrong. Okay, so that seems like step one in the argument. It doesn't seem like the whole argument, or maybe it is the whole argument. Um, it's a little hard to tell. I'll just keep reading. I'll find out. Some individuals, okay, so this looks like step two. So I'm going to take this and I'm going to sort of in my head or in my PDF program right here, I'll put something like step one. Or if I had this printed out, I might put a little one and circle it in the margin next to this argument. Because we have this argument that goes something like this, and now we have step one in the argument. So I really want to be keep tracking, keeping track of how this argument is going. So step one. Uh, step two, some individuals may want to reproduce by means of human reproductive cloning. Okay, so some individuals, so notice we're not talking about everybody here. We're not saying everybody wants to reproduce like this, just some people. And we're not even saying they do want this. Maybe nobody wants it, but they might want to. There could be people like this. So uh, remember, this is an in-principle argument. It's this sort of abstract theoretical thing. So I'm thinking, okay, so this makes sense. We're not talking about actual people who definitely exist. We're talking about people who could exist. They might want to reproduce by means of human reproductive cloning. So that seems pretty straightforward. So that's step two in the argument. I think I understand that. There's nothing sort of confusing there. I can now start to reflect on sort of what do I think about step one and step two. Step one, I don't know how I feel. I mean, it seems pretty reasonable, but I might want to think more about it. I'll sort of put that off for now because I'm, you know, reading the, argue, the, arg the article. Step two, I think I can make up my mind right now. That seems true. It seems true that some individuals may want to reproduce by means of human reproductive cloning. That's not like a crazy point. There could be people like this. I don't know. People want all sorts of things. So I think step two, okay, I'm pretty convinced by step two. So maybe this argument so far, step one, eh, maybe step two for sure. So, so far, no objections. Step three, although there are many objections to human reproductive cloning on the grounds that it violates a right or constitutes an ethical wrong, each of these objections can be dismissed via reasoned argument. Okay, so again, this looks like step three of the argument. So I'm gonna note that down somewhere in my head or on a piece of paper or on the article itself. And I ask myself, do I understand what this means? Um, although there are many objections to human reproductive cloning, so, okay, I know what that means, on the grounds that it violates a right or constitutes an ethical wrong. Okay, so that's very vague. I don't know how it would help what these people mean when they say it violates a right or constitutes an ethical wrong or why. But I do understand sort of what the point is broadly. You know, some people have arguments like this, so people have objections. Each of these objections can be dismissed via reasoned argument. Okay, so again, I don't know what the reasoned argument is. I don't know what the responses are, but I sort of know what this sentence is saying in step three. So here, I have no idea if I agree with step three of the argument or not. I just, I just have no idea because I don't know what these objections are and I don't know what the responses are. So now I sort of give up in my head the sort of project of do I agree or disagree with this argument. It's going to be a while, maybe never, until I get enough information to know. So now that's no longer something I'm keeping track of. I want to keep track of what this argument is here, but I'm not going to try to decide do I agree yet. That's just off the table for now. Therefore, assuming that the science gets to the point where it would be safe and reasonable to attempt human reproductive cloning, it ought to be allowed, given the right to reproductive freedom. So it looks like this is step four, also the conclusion. So I might write step four, I might write conclusion, or both. To me, when I read it, it kind of seems like two things. We have this assumption at the front, assuming that the science gets to the point where it would be safe and reasonable to attempt human reproductive cloning. So first I ask myself, do I understand what that means? And the answer is, yeah, you know, the science gets to the point where you don't have to like kill a bunch of people or something with failed clones. Okay, so I know what that means. That sort of seems like step four and then step five is the conclusion, which is starting with it ought to be allowed. So maybe I would split it up like that on my outline or on the piece of paper or in my PDF reader, but maybe I'm fine with just sort of four steps right now. So we'll leave it how it is. But that's something I sort of have in my mind, which is, oh, this, this last step seems to be, it seems to have two points. It's got this assumption and then the second part, which is it ought to be allowed. So I think to myself, what is it? Oh, human reproductive cloning. Okay, so I always want to keep track of these uh, pronouns. What do these uh, refer to? It, it, human reproductive cloning, ought to be allowed given the right to reproductive freedom. Okay, that's the conclusion, and good. This is the conclusion that we were trying to get to, uh, which we talked about in the first sentence. So now I've got a sort of explanation of the first sentence, and I sort of know exactly what's going on in this first paragraph, I feel like. 
I don't know how I feel about what's gone on. I don't know if I agree with this argument because there's just a lot of unknowns there, but I do have a good picture of sort of what's being described. So if this were in class or um, if there are other people here, I would pause right now and have everybody talk amongst themselves to talk about sort of what did you observe me doing? Uh, what sort of things did I do as I was reading? Uh, so if you're watching this video with other people, I would pause this video now and just talk about what did I do? What did you observe? What did you see? So pause. Welcome back. If you pause the video, hopefully you got the chance to talk it over with people. So here are some things that I was doing. So number one, I was going very, very slowly and very, very thoroughly through every single word and phrase. I wasn't skimming, I wasn't skipping over things. I was looking very, very clearly at everything that I was reading, and I was trying to understand each thing I was reading in my head. So when you read philosophy, you don't want to be skipping or skimming or ignoring certain things. You want to do your best with every single word and phrase before moving on. That doesn't mean you'll always know everything before moving on. So remember, sort of with this sentence, uh, step three, I didn't know what these objections are, and I don't know what the reasoned arguments are, so it's not like I have a complete understanding of what I'm reading, but I've satisfied myself that I sort of know as much as I can, and I sort of uh, got done as well as I can with the text that I have. Sometimes you'll be able, be able to know even less. Sometimes you'll come across unfamiliar words or phrases, or you can't understand the argument, and you just can't get past it. That's fine, but the point is you want to do as well as you can. You don't want to just skip over stuff immediately. You work very hard on each point that you're saying. So that's one thing I was doing. I was going through very slowly and clearly each step. Another thing I was doing was, as I was reading, I was thinking to myself, what do I know so far? What do I not know so far? What sort of position am I in, given what I've read? What sort of position am I likely to be in, given what I'm going to keep reading? What can I expect to see in the next sentence? What can I expect to see in the rest of the article? What does the author likely think about what they've written? Why is the author writing these sorts of things? So I was thinking about what do I know? Why do I know it? How do I know it? How confident am I that I know it? Why am I this confident or why am I not this confident? Uh, sort of uh, basically what we call metacognition or thinking about thinking. And so what I'm doing is I'm keeping sort of very clear in my head kind of what my progress is with uh, the article or sort of how I feel about how everything is going. And what that means is that I'm not just sort of treating the text as something apart from me, uh, something I'm sort of reading, but it's not like getting into my head. I'm every step of the way thinking about how is it getting into my head? What is happening when it's getting into my head? Uh, in what ways is it in my head right now? In what ways is that changing as I go from sentence to sentence? So I'm keeping track as I move through the article of my sort of intellectual progress. Um, what else am I doing? Another thing I'm doing is sort of I'm outlining the article as I go or outlining parts of the article. So already we have step one, step two, step three, step four slash conclusion. Like I said, this could maybe be split up into step four and then step five, which is the conclusion because the assumptions seem to be another step. So I have this sort of small outline being built either on the paper or in the PDF or maybe on a separate uh, set of notes that I'm writing or typing. And as I write this outline, I'm sort of filling it out. And similarly, uh, there's notes I didn't take, but I might have. So, um, you know, when I said often argued and I say, so common argument, and then what is the author's position on this argument, maybe oppose, that sort of thing. All of those sorts of comments, I just spoke them out loud to you, but I could have been writing them down and keeping sort of track of these things. And often it's better if you're writing them down and keeping track so you have a sort of big list of things that you're thinking about the article. And you don't need to keep this forever. You can sort of, as, as you go through, you noticed I was sort of changing my views on certain things. And that means you'll be changing your notes on these things. As you learn something new, you'll maybe get rid of an earlier question that you had because it answers your question. Or as you change your view about what the author is saying, you say, oh, now I'm not, now I don't think the author is opposed to this. Now I know the author is opposed, or now I know the author agrees with it, or something like that. So uh, you want to keep a running list, not uh, or of sort of as much information and stuff in the article as you can. If you're very practiced at this, you can do it in your head. If not, it helps a lot to write it down. So I recommend writing it down until you can do it all in your head. So those are the sorts of things I was doing as I went through the first paragraph and the sorts of things you want to be doing as you go through everything. 
And let's sort of keep going on to the second paragraph to see, oh, uh, I forgot the footnote, but um, let's keep going into the footnote and the second paragraph to sort of see more about how to read philosophy. So I finished this last sentence and now there's a footnote, footnote one. For examples of this position, see D.W. Brock, 2003, this is an article uh, in a book, Beecher, okay, this is an article, this is an article, this is an article. So uh, it looks like these are, there's nothing in this footnote except lots of citations. So um, this is helpful if I want to figure out what any of these are. So remember this, I was saying, I don't know how I feel about all these objections and all these replies because I haven't read any of them. I guess now if I'm curious, I can go read these. I'm not going to, I'm gonna keep reading this article, but uh, now I know sort of what's in this footnote. So, uh, but as far as I'm concerned, I can now discard this footnote. There wasn't sort of anything important in it immediately for me for understanding this article. This is just elaborating on this stuff. So next paragraph. I would like to examine a particular objection to human reproductive cloning and the arguments often used to dismiss that objection. Okay, so I, so now we have I. Remember, we haven't seen anything about what the author thinks in this first paragraph. She's just been discussing what other people think. And so it's just been a question mark. What is the author's position? Now we get a little information about what the author, the author would like to examine a particular objection to human reproductive cloning. So she says, examine here. So. I don't know how she feels about it. She doesn't say critique, she doesn't say defend, she just says examine, so I don't know what the evaluation is gonna be, but there's gonna be some sort of evaluation. I know this is gonna be at least part of the next bit of the article, so I don't know what the full article is about yet, but I do know it's gonna have this examination of the particular objection. So I'd like to examine a particular objection to human rep reproductive cloning and the arguments often used to dismiss that objection. So now there's two things I'm keeping my eye out for. One, what is the particular objection? So I know that's coming. There's gonna be some one objection. So what is that? Uh, let's get ready for that. And number two, the arguments used to dismiss it. So multiple arguments, more than one. So there's gonna be one objection coming and at least two, maybe three, maybe five, maybe a hundred arguments against the objection coming. And again, these are arguments often used to dismiss the objection. So again, remember when we saw often argued, I said people usually use that thing to talk about things they don't agree with. Not always. You could say, you know, people often eat toast for breakfast, and I eat toast for breakfast. So it doesn't mean you definitely do something different. But it often does. It usually does. So again, I'm starting to think maybe the author likes the objection, but I don't know. Again, it's still a question mark. So that's it for this first pair or this first sentence, I think. Second sentence. The objection I have in mind is the threat of psychological harms to cloned individuals. Oh, good, so here we have the objection. So remember, I was keeping my eyes out for the objection. And now we have the objection. So that's one question answered. So my question was, what is this particular objection used to dismiss or to object to reproductive cloning? And now we have the objection. It's the threat of psychological harms to cloned individuals. So I know what threat means. It means, it doesn't mean it definitely harms the individuals. It just means, oh, it could happen. Maybe it's likely to happen, something like that. So it's not like, it always harms or it definitely harms, but it at least threatens harm. But then psychological harms, I, I kind of don't know what that means. I mean, I know what psychological means. I know what harm means. Psychological harms, I can maybe think of things I'd describe as psychological harms, like, I don't know, scaring somebody or uh, giving somebody depression or uh, stressing somebody out. I guess those are psychological harms. But uh, I don't know, like what, what are the psychological harms to cloned individuals? I don't really know. So that's another question now that I'm looking out for. What are these harms? I'm curious what these harms are going to be. Um, so that's a question I sort of have now in my head. Maybe you'd write it down. Uh, and they're going to be harms to cloned individuals. So I know at least one thing about these harms. They're harms that happen to the cloned people. They don't happen to the people who are cloning the people. They don't happen to sort of society as a whole. They happen to the cloned people. So I have this mystery in my head. What are the harms? And I know one thing about them. They happen to the clones. In the case of cloning, psychological harms could result if cloned individuals were forced to recapitulate the personalities and lives of those they were cloned from, excessively violating their right to self-determination. Great, so I had this question, what are these harms? I don't know. And now I have a lot more information. So in the case of cloning, so the thing we're talking about, so that I ask myself, do I know what this means? And it's like, yeah, it's just reiterating that we're talking about what we're talking about. We're not changing the subject all of a sudden. So okay. In the case of cloning, 
Psychological harm is the thing that I was curious about earlier. Could result, so again, it's not that they will result, they won't all, it's not like necessary, it's not like they do result, but at least they could. So maybe like in principle, maybe this is another in principle argument. So they could result if, so they're gonna result only if this happens, cloned individuals were forced to recapitulate the personalities and lives they were cloned from. Uh, so recapitulate, again, a slightly complicated word. I look it up in the dictionary if I don't know it. Um, and I ask myself, okay, recapitulating personalities and lives as those they were cloned from? Okay, I guess I understand what that's talking about. So, you know, uh, if we clone Abraham Lincoln and then we expect this person to, you know, burn down the South and get shot in the movie theater, that might, you know, that would be a weird life for this person to live. Uh, so, okay, so recapitulating the personalities and lives of those they are cloned from, excessively violating their right to self-determination. So what is it to violate a right to self-determination? Eh, I guess I think to myself, well, self-determination is like making up your own mind about how to live your life, stuff like that. And I guess I can understand why this would violate somebody's right to self-determination, right? If we clone Abraham Lincoln and expect somebody to act like him, uh, the clone's right to self-determination would kind of be violated. The clone can't do whatever he would want to do. So I think I understand that sentence pretty well. Hans Jonas is usually credited with first formulating this problem, which he saw as infringing on what he termed an individual's right to ignorance. And then there's a footnote, and it's just to Hans Jonas. So it uh, doesn't look like there's anything super important here. It's just talking about where this article comes from at first. Um, but I guess this is important, a right to ignorance. So this is sort of um, maybe supposed to be equal to a violation of right to self, or equal to right to self-determination. Um, so we have up here right to self-determination, down here right to ignorance. So I guess maybe those are the same thing, or maybe one is like a subset of another. I'm not really sure about that, so that's going to be another one of those questions I have going forward, so I write that down. Uh, but then aside from that, I think I'm good with this sentence, and I'm good with the footnote. Uh, maybe if I want to know more, I can go read the book. The idea is that the cloned person, by knowing about the life of whomever they were cloned from, will know too much about themselves. Okay, so this seems like an explanation of what the right to ignorance is. Uh, ignorance is not knowing something. It's violating this right to ignorance because you know too much. So I, that seems pretty straightforward. I guess I can understand what that is. I can see how that would maybe be psychologically harmful. I'm still not sure if this counts as like self-determination or not, so still a question in my head. Joel Feinberg discussed a similar concern with the right to an open future, another footnote, another citation just to a book. So I think I get this sentence pretty good too. So open future, I guess, means like not knowing what's gonna happen in the future. So that sounds like ignorance or maybe being able to decide what happens in the future. That sounds like self-determination, or maybe it's both, or I don't really know, but I think I'm pretty good with that sentence. So uh, once again, if I were doing this in a uh, classroom setting, I would pause now and you know everyone would have this article and I would say, okay, now on your own with this next paragraph, do what I've been doing and sort of practice uh, these sort of strategies. You can do that if you're with somebody else, so you can pause the video right now. Here, I'm going to get real big. Here's this thing. You can maybe get your hands in the article some other way. Here's the paragraph. Read through the paragraph and practice, and then if you want the footnote, uh, actually, this is a substantive footnote. I've got some things to talk about, so you would want to read that too, but we can ignore it for now. So I would suggest if you're with other people, pause the video now and sort of practice what I've been doing on your own. Welcome back, uh, or if you're just watching, uh, thanks for watching. Uh, and so let's see. Well, I have to read this real quick to see what you would have done. Um, good. So when you read this first sentence, proponents of human reproductive cloning do not dispute that practice may lead to violations of the right to self-determination. So there's a few things that you maybe could have come up with when you were re reading this. First, you would have this sort of category of people, proponents of human reproductive cloning, and you would think, who does this refer to? So, you know, we're setting up these groups of people. We have Hans Jonas and Joel Feinberg. They are opposed to human reproductive cloning. Now we have the proponents of human reproductive cloning. We're still wondering where the author stands in all of this. We don't know what she thinks. 
So maybe we have a question mark, is the author one of these or is she agreeing with these people? I don't know, whatever. But uh, as we form a sort of map in our minds of where the various people are in the various positions, here's a point, here's a position we could have. Um, here's about something they don't dispute. So this is something that they agree with and also the word dispute. So uh, when you dispute something, you're sort of arguing with somebody about it, you're uh, objecting to something. And so when she's saying they don't dispute this, it's saying, it sounds to me like there's like, oh, there's an agreement here between the proponents of human reproductive cloning and Hans Jonas, Joe Feinberg, the people who oppose. So here's something the two opposing sides agree with. So that's something interesting to think about. Uh, there's a point of agreement between them, even though they have different conclusions. So what is this point of disagreement? It's that it might lead to uh, violation of the right to self-determination. So this thing we were talking about up here, it sounds like people who endorse reproductive cloning don't disagree with that. So now I have in my mind the question, oh, what do they disagree with? Because they do want cloning, so they don't fully agree with the entire argument, but they agree with uh, the self-determination stuff. So as you're trying to build up a picture of the counter argument of the people who support cloning, we're getting more detail, but we still don't know what they say. So that's what you might get from this first sentence. Here's another word, this word may. So again, we've been very careful as we've read of words like uh, may down here and could over here and um, one more, uh, things like this. These are very important words to always keep track of. So philosophy is written uh, very precisely. And so philosophers use words to mean things and they don't use uh, words that don't mean things. They, so they're very specific about the words they pick. So when you use a word like may as opposed to will, you're saying, oh, it could happen as opposed to it will happen or may as opposed to must. It might happen as opposed to it has to happen. And so these mean very different things. So if I say the practice may lead to violations of the right, I'm saying, oh, it, it might, it could, sometimes it will maybe, or it might have a risk of these. I'm not saying it always will. I'm not saying it must lead to these. I'm just saying it could. And so that's something uh, you might have picked up on. And so those sorts of words you want to be very careful uh, keeping track of. Um, and I think that's most of what you might have got out of the first sentence. Second sentence, they even acknowledge that these violations could cause psychological harms to clone. So even is a word that sort of suggests like, oh, like uh, even more, we're sort of building on the previous thing and making it even more sort of extreme. And so again, this was interesting because we got a point of uh, agreement between the two opposing sides. And so the word even is like, oh, they even agree on another thing. So this is even more surprising. So as I'm keeping in mind how I think about the various views, here's another an even more surprising thing about the views. They even agree on this further thing, that violation could cause psychological harms to clones. And could is another one of those words, like may. So again, they don't say it will or it must or it always will. They just say it could. So that's we're keeping in mind what those things mean. So I think that's most of what you would get out of the second sentence. And then, but they often proceed with their endorsement of human reproductive cloning by uh, dismissing these psychological harms in two ways. Good. So when you read two ways, you want to have in your head, you get ready for those two ways. You have this big question mark and a one and a two, and now you're ready to fill those out. And it turns out you fill it out right here. Um, so whenever an author is sort of giving you numbers or giving you signposts for how the rest of the sentence or the paragraph or the article is going to go, you want to sort of set that up in your outline and get ready to fill it out either on paper or in your head or on the PDF, uh, things like this. Um, and there's plenty more you could get out of the third sentence and so on and so forth. But um, hopefully the general position is clear, which is this is the way, or at least a way, to read philosophy. It works on whatever philosophy you're reading, not just uh, sort of modern philosophical articles like this, but even historical philosophy, long books, things like this. Um, even when you're uh, reading uh, novels or philosophical novels, things like this. You want to pay very close attention to everything the author is saying. You may have noticed to yourself that this takes a long time. It's very uh, intellectually intense. Your brain is working very hard when you're doing this. You generate a lot of notes very quickly. 
very quickly revise the notes that you're generating so your notes don't stay static. You have to go back and think about your notes and cross them out. Uh, you have to be thinking about what you're thinking, and so that's another sort of, um, uh, it, it adds to the difficulty of what's going on. You have a lot of things going on in your head. That's why I suggest getting a lot of this out onto paper as you're doing it, so it doesn't have to all be in here. Um, so it takes a long time, but that is how uh, philosophical reading works. One common question people have is, look, do you ever get faster? Does it ever, do you ever just like, once you get very good at this, you just go boom, right through an article? And the answer is no, not really. I mean, with practice, you will get a bit faster. Uh, you'll get more used to things, especially if you read the same sort of philosophy very often. You'll see the same sorts of things and you'll get used to those and you'll get faster at dealing with those. But broadly, it's always going to be a slow process. Even when you're an expert at this, it's always going to be very, very slow and very, very difficult. So what gets easier is knowing how to read and understanding what you read. As you practice, you'll get much, much better at understanding philosophy and sort of thinking about philosophy and reading about philosophy, especially. So that's what you'll get better at. You're not really going to speed it up. There's no sort of shortcut uh, to philosophy here. Another common question people ask is, look, uh, some people suggest that you sort of skim the article or uh, the book or things like that, or sort of read it very quickly to get an idea of what's going on. But you, Danny, you're telling me to go very, very slowly in every word, and what's up with that? So the thought is, it's fine if you want to skim the entire article before you read. I sort of prefer to just start reading like this, but there's nothing wrong with skimming the whole article um, or the whole book to get, sort of get an idea for what's going on and then reading closely. And in fact, the abstract is kind of a way of skimming the article before you read it. And I usually read the abstract before I read the article. So there's nothing wrong with uh, those sorts of things. The point here is just when you eventually read the article for real effectively, this is how you should be reading, closely and slowly. So I think those are the two main questions people have. People have often have many more questions, and you're welcome to contact me if you have uh, more questions about sort of this reading process, how to do it, why to do it, things like that. Uh, but hopefully this video has sort of given you enough that you can now go practice on your own and get better at reading uh, philosophy yourself.